glad that you're here. So thankful for these men that participate in leading and uh, speaking and doing announcements and singing and praying. Uh, without them, we just simply couldn't couldn't get it done. And it takes a uh, takes a lot to uh, get up in front of a crowd. I know uh, as we spoke uh, last week talking about praying, a lot of times uh, you know people just have trouble with public praying, and it's not because they're not spiritual. It's not because they don't spend time with prayer to God. It's just that it's a difficult thing a lot of times to stand up and to uh, publicly speak. Was able this week to go out to Henderson, T uh, Tennessee, to the lectures, and just so thankful for that opportunity that's been afforded to me uh, for as long as I have been here. I think that was uh, either my 12th or 13th uh, visit out to uh, the lectureships out there, and I was really uh, interested in the content this year. Not that I'm not always, but uh, we're just about done in the Book of Genesis on Wednesday nights, and so we're looking at Exodus. And I've been looking at a couple of books, maybe to try to expedite our study of Exodus. We've been in Genesis, I guess, about a year. And I thought, boy, it might be a good idea to move a little quicker when we got to the book of Exodus. And uh, just a lot of good material there. And uh, so thankful to be able to uh, take, uh, take part in that. And I believe that will help uh, me as we start that study. was also able to go and uh, see an old friend of mine. Michael Hughes was the longtime preacher for the Marion Church of Christ in Marion, Arkansas, just right across the river from Memphis. And I hadn't seen him in years, and it was so good to see him. Michael is a big uh, uh, missionary to India. He really enjoys that. If he could do anything, he'd rather be in India. So it was certainly good to see him, and uh, he makes about two trips a year there now. And it was good to see him, good to see a lot of brethren that we don't normally uh, get to see, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a very, very good thing. If you ever get a chance, there's always room uh, for more if you'd like to make that trip sometime. Uh, I know I'd love to spend some time with you, and we could do that together. It's a, it's a spiritual feast. You spend basically four days studying a particular topic, and uh, you hit it from so many different angles. And so the lesson we're going to look at this morning is one that was uh, looked at by one of my favorite people, one of my favorite preachers in all the world. His name is Dan Winkler. Uh, he was uh, met Dan when I was a student at the uh, Nashville School of Preaching back in 1997, 1998. It's hard to believe it's been that long ago. And as they were announcing him this week, uh, I learned that he's been preaching since I was five years old. And he just doesn't look that old when you see him. But uh, and he's not. He's not really that old. Started preaching young, that's what we'll say. But uh, so this lesson is basically drawn off of uh, a lesson he had that I said, you know, that, that'll preach. And uh, something he said in it that's pretty simple. Uh, all of us know it. But, you know, sometimes when you hear something, it just seems profound to you. And, uh, and I thought, you know, that'll preach. We, I would love to be able to talk about that one thing. So... This morning, we're going to talk about, from Exodus chapter 5 and 6, the idea of who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Think of a couple questions that we could ask and just keep it in your mind's eye. Number one, what is God like? You know, what does God look like? I know they spent a lot of time, uh, some interesting um, uh, you know, they ask those hard questions sometimes at these lectures, and they'll assign a fellow a particular uh, topic, uh, you know, a particular question, just one, uh, one verse, if you will, something that we all have thought about, like why could Moses not see God's face, for instance? And, uh, you know, the simple answer there, well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus would say that in John chapter 4. But uh, it was, it's interesting to do things like that because I've spent time. What, what's it going to, what does God, when we finally get to see God, Face to face, we have to leave this life to do that. What is that going to be like? What does God look like? Now, I think we, you know, are blessed enough to be able to take a step into God's throne room. Revelations chapter 4 and 5. Um, Isaiah, what is that? Uh, chapter 6. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. 
uh, where we actually get to go. And Paul was so impressed with the, the throne room of God, if you will, or the heavens, that he doesn't even talk about what he saw. He doesn't get past what he heard. He said, I would love to be able to tell you, but I, it was words that cannot be uttered. So Paul was just super impressed with, with what he heard. What does God, what is God like? And, and number two, what does God like? In other words, once I get past the idea of, of what does God look like, what, does, what is he like, what's his, you know, how is he made up, then I have to start thinking, well, what makes God happy? What can I do to make God happy? And so this is what Brother Winkler said that just really stuck with me uh, because it, it's so true. Uh, my concept of God, your concept of God, who you think God is, by and large, will guide your conduct. What you think God is, who you think God is, how you think God operates, that will determine how you look at things. I know I have you in Exodus chapter 5 and 6, and that's great. Keep your finger there, if you will. But uh, turn over to Romans chapter 1 with me, because I want to show you some people that knew God but their concept of God changed. They made God in their image and thereby did whatever they wished. You see, once we determine that God isn't the God of the Bible or doesn't do things like God in the Bible says he's going to do things, in other words, how we change our perception of God can change how we behave when it comes to God. Notice in chapter 1, uh, Verse, verse 18, beginning, he basically says we have no excuse because the heavens and the earth, they show us who God is. God has showed them, verse 20, from the invisible things of the world, we ought to be able to tell that there's a God in heaven. But notice as a result of people changing their concept of God, changing who God is in their mind, not that God changes, but they've changed how they look at God. It says because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. You see that happen with Israel. They get a firsthand experience of the God of heaven, and yet they never seem it, 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 uh, as a nation to really understand who God is and what God expects. And they get this picture of God in their mind, and so they can serve God how they conceive God being, how their concept of God. Well, God loves us. We're his chosen people. We can get away with anything. We've got the temple. Look at the temple right there. Isn't it beautiful? That's where the law is kept. We've had King David. We had King Solomon. We've been one of the most powerful nations in the world. We have the high priest. We have the priesthood of God. We can kill, maim, murder, rape, plunder, and, pl you know, plunder and pillage, and it doesn't matter. That's how they had changed God. No, the God of heaven hadn't changed. But their concept of him, notice, they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, what happened? They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. They worshipped images. Kings would change themselves into deity. They'd say, look at me, I'm king, I'm deity. And some would even go so far as to, man, to demand worship. And men would worship them. <clears throat> Made unto corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. We're going to talk about Pharaoh in just a few minutes. And he had a, a pantheon of gods. Um, you know, the god Ra, he was just over the sun. They had a god over the Nile. They had a god that every one of the ten, ten plagues that we look at in the book of Exodus... It's basically a god getting at one of the false gods of the, pagan, or the uh, Egyptian philosophy. You see, that's what they had done. They had changed God into corruptible things. Notice God didn't stop them, but he gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They, God allowed men to believe whatever they want to. Man is a free moral agent. God gave the evidence but he says, I'm not going to stop you. If you want to go and do something crazy like worship fish and birds and things of that nature, you go right ahead. Here's my word. This is what you should be doing. But I'm not going to make you do that. 
As a matter of fact, Pharaoh was of, was of the temperament, and we're going to see this in just a little bit, that God knew exactly how to flip Pharaoh's switches. He knew Pharaoh was an arrogant man. He knew that Pharaoh really thought that he was God, God in the flesh, and that his children were going to be God. He was arrogant. He wouldn't listen. And it says over and over again that God hardened Pharaoh's heart simply by doing what? Telling Pharaoh to do things. That hardened Pharaoh's heart. He wasn't going to listen to anybody, as we'll see in our question here in a moment in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 5. He, wasn't, he could care less. Who is this God? I'm God, Pharaoh would say. What, what do you think? What do you, what do you do? And so his heart was hardened. Uh, just, it was really interesting. Uh, we just happened when we were over in Marion visiting Michael. Uh, he was first class. He had taught in a long time. He's had a, had a lot of health issues. So it was so good to see him to be able to do that. But he was talking about you want to harden, harden someone's heart, you can harden someone's heart. Just like that. And he gave an example, and I was going like, yep, that would do it. <laughs> he talked about a woman just having a baby. And you know how we love our children, you know. And he says, uh, he said, I don't care what woman it is. If you go up and you see her and you see that baby, you say, oh, let me see that baby. And she shows you that baby. If you say, oh, my, my, that's the ugliest baby I believe I have ever seen. Guess what? You have just hardened her heart. And, and what was so funny is he said it may even be true, but it's still, you know, you're going to harden uh, her heart. And so we can see how that God could harden a man like Pharaoh's heart by simply allowing the situation to play into his ego, play into that fact that he thinks he's somebody and he doesn't have to listen to anybody. That's what happens here in Romans chapter 1. Then in Romans chapter 1, what you have is Paul getting after the pagans and saying you've got it all wrong. You have changed your concept of God, and therefore you are like you are. They were wicked. Men with men, women with women, homosexuality was rampant. Why? Because they had changed the concept of God. God creating man and woman in the garden. The man for the woman, the woman for the man. They had changed that and said, you don't have to do that. Do whatever you Because they had changed God. They said, God isn't like that. Oh, he doesn't punish sin. You do whatever you want to do. And that's why when Moses and Joshua come down from the mount, they're basically having an orgy. The children of Israel just delivered by the God of heaven, and they rose up to play. That is just the Bible's very polite way of saying they were partying hard, and it had a lot to do with sexual immorality because that's what they just came out of. Paganism, that, that they used that as a tool it was something they did. Oh, you want to celebrate your sexuality, don't you? You're free, just kind of like we did back during the 60s and 70s. Remember the free love uh, uh, situation there, which resulted in a whole lot of disease and so forth. They changed their concept of God, and that's what happens. My concept of God will guide my conduct. Do I think God's really going to punish sin? If I'm like, well, no, nah, he's kind of like that friendly God. You know, he, God is love. We don't have to worry about it then I'm not going to be so concerned about sin. If I believe that God indeed will do exactly what he says, then I'm going to approach that whole subject a lot more differently. Now, Exodus chapter 5. Let's go back there. Appreciate you uh, going with me there to Romans. It says, and afterward, now we've kind of skipped over the part where God recruits Moses. Moses doesn't want to go. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing uh, all that goes through there. I thought one of the interesting things brought up at the lecture was the fact that for 40 years you know Moses' life can be divided into three 40 year increments the first 40 years you could say that was Moses thinking that he was somebody well the next 40 years he spends out in the middle of the wilderness sheep herding and that's where we're going to find it we find him in Mount Sinai which is in the middle of nowhere uh, you know and he's there when God calls him but for the next 40 years Moses is thinking that he's nobody. And then the next 40 years, when God commissions Moses to bring the people out, we find God making somebody from nobody. I thought that was a great, great illustration. Notice in 5.1 it says, Afterward, now Moses and Aaron, they make that big journey all the way to Egypt, went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, 
Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So it's an arrogant question. Who is God? He Pharaoh don't know anything about God. Uh, he doesn't. He, he expects. He's, he's explained everything that takes place in the world through his pagan made-up gods. And so he's created God in his image. As a matter of fact, he thinks that he is a God. And so uh, we find that uh, we're not going to spend time with it this morning, but for the next, uh, what, seven chapters, he's going to find out exactly who God is. And in chapter 12, verse 31, he calls for Moses and Aaron by night and says, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord. Look at that, capital L-O-R-D, the Tetragrammaton, the I am that I am, the Jehovah, God's covenant name. He goes from not saying, from, I don't know God, who's God, to saying, you go serve God, not many, one of many gods, but you go serve the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, that name of God. You go serve him, the God. You see, he's figured out who God is. Go serve the Lord, the literally the I am that I am. That's a big play that Jesus makes on that in the New Testament. You know, one of the things uh, you remember we're going to talk about this morning in Sunday school during the trial of Jesus, the high priest is they're bringing in all these witnesses uh, that can't agree because they're all lying, and uh, you know, which is amazing. Here they are having a religious court in which they're breaking every religious law they can think of to try to convict somebody of something, but they're doing that. And the high priest finally has just wants to wash his hands of it because it's not working. And he says, you know, I'll just ask him. And he says, are you, you know, the son of God? And what does Jesus say? I, what? Am. Brings us right back to this. I am. And then he quotes Daniel. And what do they do? They crucify him for, for uh, quoting the Bible. Well, you see, Pharaoh is going to come to know God because of all these plagues that are fixing to take place in chapter 6 uh, through uh, chapter 12. And that same God, the same God that spoke to Pharaoh, that same God that was with Moses, says to me and you today, notice the last part of verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Brethren, we have it made so great today. Back this time, Israel itself, the, the children of Israel, the children of, of Jacob, are going to learn more about God in the next few weeks than they have known the 400 years prior to that. They're going to learn more about God. And when we look at that and they set up the tabernacle and they start the Levitical priest system and the worship of God and the, the shadows of the Old Covenant, today as, as part of the New Testament, with the shed blood of Jesus Christ being bought, being redeemed, instead of it being a shadow, we have the, the fruition of it. We have forgiveness of sins. It's not God of the shadows. We, we see exactly what God wants us to do. We don't have to go to a man who happens to be born of a particular family called a Levite and have him offer up our sacrifice. We don't have to go to one of Aaron's sons as a priest and have him make atonement for us. We have the Jesus. We have the Christ. We can petition the very throne room of God, something they couldn't do. We, as the children of God today, as priests, as a peculiar people, as a holy nation, have so much more. All spiritual blessings are in the Christ. We have the fruition of what all this was pointing to, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We have a very, very special relationship, one that the children of Israel could not even dream. Notice the conflict between God and Pharaoh might encourage us to rely on the Lord ourselves. And Paul, as he would talk about putting on the Christian armor, says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on that whole armor of God that, may, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This conflict with Moses is going to give us three things, basically an introduction to God, we're going to see an altercation with God, and lastly, an appreciation for the God of heaven. First of all, this introduction. Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? I don't know him. Neither will I let Israel go. Who is the Lord? I, I. Notice what he says here. Who is the Lord that I, the Pharaoh, 
the king of all Egypt, the greatest, most powerful nation on earth, that I should obey his voice. I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Well, boy, he's going to have to eat some words, isn't he? Because not only is he going to let Israel go, he's going to basically run them off. Oh, he's going to learn a lot about God. We see his arrogance, we see his ignorance, and we also see insolence. Just like, I'm not doing that, speaking evil. Our concept of God, remember, will have a great deal to do with our conduct. Pharaoh, Pharaoh doesn't know God. He could care less about God. So as an altercation, we're going to see that, uh, and it's interesting because in chapter 6, God is going to take these three points. He's going to reverse them. Number one, Moses says God is present. Notice what he says. The, Moses and Aaron went in and told the Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God. He's with us. He's told us this is what you need to do. God is personal. Notice verse 3. The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Not just anybody, but the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. He has met with us, the God of, of Abraham. And, and God is our God today. He is personal. It's a personal relationship. I'm not going to get, you know, we, we spoke of this a few weeks ago, the idea of uh, us getting into heaven on the coattails of the church. That isn't going to happen. We don't sneak into heaven. God is with you. He's a personal God. Jesus is your Savior. He's my Savior as well. But he is, uh, wants a personal relationship with us. That's what it's all about. That's why prayer is so important. God speaks to us through his word. We speak to God through our prayers. God is present. God is personal. And the one thing that we need to remember, and sometimes I think, brethren, we forget, that is God's punitive. What do I mean by that? God is going, he's going to keep his word. And God has said that he will punish those that do not obey him. Notice the last part of, of, uh, chapter, of verse 3 there. Moses asked, let us go three days in a journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Well, now God doesn't do that to Israel, but God does exactly that to Egypt. He falls on them with pestilence and ultimately with the sword. Uh, figuratively, the death of the firstborn, the uh, angel of death, and then, of course, Pharaoh's uh, entire army. I just thought that was so interesting. One of the things, you know, you have so many different classes there. You have these guys coming in talking to, you know, that they're so well-educated in archaeology and things of that nature. And, uh, it's just a real privilege to be able to get together with a bunch of folks like that and be able to study some of these things. One of the things that they looked at was the fact that you had these the history, secular history. Now, this is Egyptian history, and they chronicle stuff. They write it down. Remember the hieroglyphics? That's, what, that's how they wrote, little word pictures, kind of like emojis now, you know, that we do. But that's how they wrote. That's how they communicated. And they kept detailed records of the great campaigns of the pharaohs now, remember, Pharaoh's not a personal name. Pharaoh is like Caesar or the name king. It's just what the top person in Egypt was called. They kept detailed logs of the wars and the, and the victories and the conquerings of these pharaohs right up to this time period. And then you know what they talk about? Nothing. And you know why that's probably happened? Where's the army? Well, right, it's at the bottom of the Red Sea along with the Pharaoh uh, for that time. I thought that was very, very interesting. God is punitive. When the Bible in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul's trying to encourage the Thessalonians and said, to you who are troubled, you know, you're going through persecutions and things, rest with us. When the God, when the Lord, you know, shall descend with his, in flaming fire with his angels, doing what? Taking vengeance on them, that's wrath. That's punitive. That's punishment on them that have obeyed not the gospel, that don't believe in God. God is going to punish the wicked. And brethren, sometimes I'm afraid that maybe we just don't think that's going to be the case. Or it might encourage us to be more evangelistic, even in our own homes, even in our, our families and our co-workers and just the people that we run across. If we really think God is dead serious about goats on the left, sheep on the right, Enter in, thy good and faithful servant, you know, cast them into, bind them hand and foot and cast them into the lake of fire. And that's going to be a real day at a real point in time somewhere in the future. 
then I know it ought to motivate us. I don't want to go there. I don't want anything to do with the lake of fire. I don't want anything to do with worms that died not. I don't want anything to do where people are screaming, uh, gnashing their teeth, a bottomless pit, and a fire that is not quenched. I don't want anything to do with that. But the God of heaven that told me how much he loves me has also told me this is what's going to happen to those who aren't faithful. So, Ronnie, you need to be faithful. God is punitive. Well, notice how God, now this is Moses describing, describing God. He says, God told me, you know, God's present, God's personal, he's the God of the Hebrews, and he, you know, if we don't do this, he's going to get on to us with pestilence and with a sword, he's punitive. Now listen to God describe himself. That's what happens in in Exodus chapter 6. He changes, he reverses it, if, if you will. Notice in chapter 6, verse 1, Then the Lord, uh, American Standard, of course, says Jehovah, that's uh, God's name, said unto Moses, Now thou shalt see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go. He isn't going to be knocked down. He isn't going to be thrown out, you know. He, as Pharaoh of the nation, is going to let my people go. With a strong hand he shall drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. So God is punitive. But notice he's personal. I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, verse 3, by the name of El Shaddai, or God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, or that tetragrammaton we talk about, Yahweh, Yehwah, however they said it. We don't know how. That Well, we do know how the Jews said it. They said it Adonai, which isn't even close to how it's spelled. Because it was so holy to them, they didn't want to pronounce it. They said, we're not even going to talk it. We're not even going to say it. So when we see that, we're going to stick the word Adonai, which simply means Lord there. So he says, this is how I'm going to be known. I was not known to them by this name, but you're going to know me as that. Verse 5, 4, excuse me. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of the pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers or sojourners. And I, verse 5, have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel. He's personal. I hear them. He says, and I have remembered my covenant. And he's also present. The right opposite of how Moses described him to Pharaoh is how God describes himself. Notice verse 6. He says, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you up out of the, or bring you up out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning that which I swear to give unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it you for an heritage I am. The Lord, pretty pretty present, huh? One of the things that you, you see happening in there is the fact that God says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the other, but how's he doing it? He's doing it through Moses. Moses is the one bringing them up. That's when you talk. I was reading a, a post by a friend who said, and it was kind of interesting because this preacher uh, had said, uh, when he was asked how many people he had led to the Lord, he said, I haven't led any of them. He said, Jesus led them all, you know. And he said, boy, preachers need to hear that. And I'm saying, no, preachers don't need to hear that. Because how did the Lord do it? How does the Lord do it today, folks? Does the Lord just jump down and, and hop on somebody's heart and say, go be saved? That is not how it happens. In a day and time when miracles were being done, that's not how it happened. How was it done? Jesus appeared the one time that we find the exception, if you will, to Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And what's he tell him? Go into that city and it'll be told thee what thou must do. Who's going to tell you? An earthen vessel. What did Paul talk to the Corinthians about? He says you have many teachers and so forth, but you only have one father. What was he talking about? How they obeyed the gospel. He was the first one that preached to them. He would call Timothy his beloved son. Titus, excuse me. Peter would call Mark his son. <coughs> son in the gospel. You see, if people are going to learn the truth, and God is going to exercise his power today. 
If God is going to reach people with the gospel, you know how he's going to do it? Yeah, I realize when I point at you, I got three coming right back at me. God doesn't just send out messages in the sky. God requires, asks me and you to go into all the world and to preach the gospel because they're not going to hear it. The children of Israel, God brought them out of Egypt, but how did he do it? He did it through Moses. Moses, the great deliverer, which, of course, is a type of the Christ that we see in the New Testament. The lawgiver of the Old Testament. Christ, the lawgiver of the New Testament. Moses brought the children of Israel out of bondage of Egypt. Jesus brings the children of God out of bondage of sin. You see the types, the antitypes? Here, God is working through Moses, and he's saying, I'm the one doing the work. Yes, it's God doing the work when we preach the gospel, but we still have to do the preaching part, the teaching part. That's our responsibility. Yes, God is present, but he uses earthen vessels to preach the message today. Not only an altercation with God, but now we have an appreciation of God. Boy, you're talking about a fella that we should be able to relate to. Moses is, <laughs> he just catches grace. He doesn't want to go. Oh, man. Chapter 4, oh, God, you know, Lord, I am just not the guy you want. I can't preach, I can't teach, I can't sing, I can't pray, I can't do anything. You don't want me. I'm worthless. Get somebody else. <coughs> well, I can't even take a track and lay it in a bathroom somewhere. I, I just can't do it. I'm, it's not in me. Get somebody else. What did God say? It's you. You're who I'm counting on. I know you've heard the story. It, it illustrates the lesson. You know, the Lord gets back to heaven having just been crucified, and he's left the apostles, and the angels are talking to Jesus saying, well, that was great, man. That was the way that all played out. But, but you know, you've only got these 12 guys down here now that are going to do some preaching. What, what happens, you know, if that don't work? What's, the, what's plan B? And, you know, the story goes, Jesus says, there is no plan B. There is no other way than me and you preaching the gospel. There's no other way than me and you teaching the lost. If the world is going to know the truth, it's going to know it by the church, the pillar and the ground of truth. If not, it's going to watch some of these denominational programs that are not going to tell them what to do to be saved, and they're going to think things are just great. When in reality, they are not. And what happens to Moses as a result of that? Okay, I'll go. I don't really want to. But I'll do it, Lord. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Sends Aaron with him. They're commissioned together. They go. And what do they do? Moses tells the elders what God would have them to do. And they're like, oh, right, great. Let's do this. And then the hardship starts. And who do they go after? The mouthpiece. That's right. Moses is going to be mistreated for doing something he's not really crazy about doing anyway. But he's going to do it because God has told him to do it. And now he's going to catch great grief for doing that very thing. And he is going to be criticized. Notice what the children of Israel say to Moses after their tasks have become so hard because Pharaoh's kept up the bricks uh, demand but won't give them any straw. They said, the Lord look upon you and judge. We want God to hold you accountable, Moses, for making our life so miserable. What was he doing? He was trying to deliver them. They're going to learn a lot about that over the next few weeks. As these plagues are brought, they're going to come to understand this is God working. This is not Moses. Right now, they're giving Moses down the road. Wendell Winkler, years ago, Dan related this story, talking to a group of preachers in Alabama, said, one of the things you just need to wrap your rope around and come to an understanding of now as a preacher, you will always, you will never be able to get away from being criticized. I'd say that fits right in with elders too, church leaders. If you're trying to do the Lord's work, don't think that you're not going to be mistreated. Don't think that people aren't going to criticize you. That's exactly what happens here. It's one of the reasons we try to encourage brethren to be supportive and uplifting because this is part of it. Rejected. They're just going to flat out tell him, uh, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Notice verse 9, Moses spake unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit, for bondage. They don't like what's happening there. They just tell him, won't you leave? They're disappointed. Why? Because Moses is doing what God told him to do. They don't see the big picture. How many times have, have we had that happen in our lives? This is what way we want it to go, but 
It doesn't go that way, and we're like, God, why would you do that? And then come to find out it was the best thing that ever happened. We don't see it all. We don't know what's going on. We just have our little point of view, and so often we're, we're wrong about certain things. We need to remember, first of all, beware. God is love. That's what the Bible says. But in Hebrews 12, 29 and Romans eleven twenty two, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Yes, God is a God of love, but God is a God of his word, and he's told us that he will be a punitive God. So we need to remember God cares. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Revelation 7, 16 and 17, the lamb shall wipe all the tears from their eyes. And remember, sometimes it may not feel like it, but God is there. He's with us. The psalmist would say in Psalms 39, 139, verse 7, beginning, if I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths, you're there. I can't everywhere I go, God is there. We need to remember that. God is with us. And so, just like in Exodus, we see the lamb, the sacrificial lamb we're going to see. We're going to see the Passover inaugurated, the death of the firstborn, the last of the plagues. Today, our Passover, of course, is the Christ. But one of the things we need to remember, friends, brethren, is that, yes, indeed, Jesus is the Lamb of God that cometh to take away the sins of the world. Also remember, he is called the Lion tribe of Judah. You have the twofold nature of God, if you will. God, uh, Jesus came the first time to be the Paschal Lamb, to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. The next time he comes will not be like that. The next time he comes, you'll be the Lion of Judah. He will be coming in flaming fire. It will be the day of judgment. We want to be ready to meet him. What does that involve? Obeying the gospel. Having obeyed the gospel, living the faithful life, living a, the Christian life, which sometimes isn't easy to do. Matter of fact, it's the most difficult thing you'll, you'll ever do. But it's the most important thing that you will ever do. Perhaps you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel, you've never repented of your sin, having confessed Jesus as Christ and being baptized for the remission of your sins. We encourage you to do that. It's not something you want to put off. It's not something you want to wait till your heart becomes so hard and you don't even think about it something you need to do if you're thinking about it but for a lot of us being Christians walking the walk sometimes can be more difficult than we had made, than we had bargained that the Bible warns of this constantly telling us to re-examine ourselves and to talk to our brethren help them encourage us to be the kind of people that we need to be if you're here this morning we can help you in any way we encourage you to come